This is Classical Ideas with Greg Soden. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. Today, I bring you a conversation with Professor Carrie Duncan from the University of Missouri Religious Studies Department. The conversation is broken into two distinct parts. The first part is about Middle Eastern archaeological work based on Dr. Duncan's experiences in Israel and Jordan. The second part discusses the first century and questions such as, who was the historical Jesus? What was his town like? What was life like in first century Palestine? What was first century Judaism like? And more. Dr. Duncan is interested in the ways that ancient Mediterranean religious communities express their religiosity in material forms, particularly when those forms contradict, undermine, or complicate textual representations of that religion. Duncan's recent research has focused on the use of commemorative language in women's inscriptions among ancient Jewish diaspora communities that challenge received ideas of how leadership was gendered in early synagogues. Duncan's interests in materiality are enhanced by participation in numerous archaeological excavations. She is a senior staff member on the following projects in Jordan. The Ein Garandal Archaeological Project, the Petra North Ridge Project, and the Madaba Plains Excavation. She teaches courses on the Hebrew Bible, New Testament, the Jesus of History, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and more. In 2018, she was given a Kemper Teaching Fellowship at the University of Missouri. Also, one last note, at the end of the episode, we discuss the Bethlehem of Galilee and talk about a particular scholar whose name is Mark A. Chansey at Southern Methodist University. I also stumbled across an article from NPR in 2012 called Dig Finds Evidence of Another Bethlehem, citing the work of Aviram Oshri from the Israel Antiquities Authority and Paula Fredrickson, a scholar of the historical Jesus at Boston University. Without further delay, here's Dr. Kerry Duncan at the University of Missouri. Welcome to Classical Ideas. This is Greg Soden. I'm here today with Dr. Carrie Duncan from the University of Missouri Religious Studies Department. Dr. Duncan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. So can you introduce yourself and your background and a little bit of your areas of academic interest? Sure. Um, I received a degree in archaeology from Tufts University as an undergrad. I went from there to Harvard University and have an MA in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. After a short quarter-life crisis, I then went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where I received a master's and a PhD degree in religious studies, focusing on ancient Mediterranean religions, which is what I teach here at Mizzou. Fantastic. So I have an interest in archaeology but I have no knowledge in archaeology. I just think that it's a fascinating way to spend a life. Um, What drew you to archaeological work? In high school at that moment, and, you know, being old school back when you took the PSATs and then people mailed you things in the mail, um, you know, inundated with college brochures and other things, I had no idea what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go. So I um, helpfully threw them all in a box under my bed. Um, a while later, I was given some magazines called a magazine called Biblical Archaeology Review, which friends of my parents received, and they had a bunch of old copies, and they were trying to shuffle them off on somebody else. So they asked me if I would like to have them, and I started reading and was entranced. And then I realized this wasn't just sort of entertainment. These were experts. These were people whose job it was to do cool things like archaeology and then write about it. And I thought, wow, that's a job that people have. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. Um, So I did a little research and I figured out where some of those people who were writing these articles in Biblical Archaeology Review taught. And I dug all those brochures out from under the bed and went through them and 
um, narrowed down to a couple of places where the people who wrote in the magazine um, taught and chose Tufts University because Jody Magnus taught there. Excellent. So what was the moment where archaeology and like ancient religion came together? Like what was it about archaeology in like the Holy Land region that connected those two dots for you? I just always been interested in that part of the world. Um, When I visited Tufts University as a high school senior and walked into Jody's office and said, hi, I'd like to be an archaeologist, she very helpfully said, you're never going to get a job. There are just no jobs in archaeology. What you have to do is get training and a degree in a related field, a field that is employable, and then go be an archaeologist with your own time and grant money, however you want to do that. And that was really helpful and practical advice. Um, It's how I got to where I am today. And so thinking about the the region that I was interested in and the fields that are associated with it and the kinds of jobs that are out there, what people will pay you to actually do, um, becoming trained as a biblical scholar made a lot of sense. It just happened that the primary text pertaining to the region and periods that I was interested in was a religious one. So I sort of fell into the religion part almost by accident. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you that that is an insanely impressive high school senior that will walk into a specific professor's office based on pre-research of who is an expert in what field at a university. I was that kind of nerd. That's just fantastic. I think that's perfect. So, What areas of the world have you done archaeological work in? Um, I have worked in Israel, in Greece, in Italy, and in Jordan. Okay, so I know that you have, have you mostly focused in like the Jordan area and Israel? Were those like the top two that you've done? Yes, more work there. I've been in Jordan since 2010. Okay, so I have this really random question that I'm always curious about. So in the Middle East an area that is so ancient and so important to so many populations of people. What is the bureaucratic process like for being an archaeologist in the Middle East? Because it's got to be complicated and challenging to get things done. It's very complicated, and it does vary a lot by country. And so each country has a Department of Antiquities, and you have to follow the rules that that, um, that government sector sets up. Um And so one of the reasons that I enjoy working in Jordan and think that it's important that work go on in Jordan is because it is a country that does not have a great deal of money in comparison, say, to Israel, and so needs the investment of um, outside teams, of foreign teams, to come in and work with the Jordanian people and the Antiquities Authority there to um, uncover and preserve Jordan's ancient heritage. So what is it about Jordan that speaks to you like as a scholar? Like what are you looking for or seeking whenever you are doing archaeological work in Jordan specifically? Well, of course, in the periods that are the focus of my research, there wasn't a border where we have our modern borders. And so when you think about sort of the the implications of working in Jordan, that um, changes sort of how we how we do things that the everyday of the the daily process of being in the field but when you think about what the life was like for say the the romans um in the the fourth century when we were when when they were occupying the site that we're working at in southern jordan the there was a series of forts sort of moving up the arva valley the, the where today the modern border between southern israel and jordan exists but the fort down the road is actually in israel and so in the ancient world, there wasn't uh, some kind of, of strong demarcation that happens there. And so when we think about sort of what, what draws me to Jordan is the sort of the modern culture. Um, but for our, my research purposes, Israel, Jordan is all sort of one big, one big area that was part of the, a similar um, cultural environment in the ancient world. Do a lot of do a, do more archaeologists try to go to Israel than Jordan? Like is Jordan kind of like overlooked almost? Um, no, there are many expeditions in Jordan. Um, I don't know. People have people have a variety of motivations for working in one country or the other, and some people do manage to do both. Um, I don't want to sort of speak too much to things that I don't 
know enough about, but my impression at least is that it can be more difficult to be a foreign team leader working in Israel. There's sort of, there's, there's more, um, you need to have sort of more inside connections is my, again, my impression. I am not the person on my team that's responsible for, um, for establishing the permit process. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, it's not a job that I particularly want. Um, but my impression is that you sort of need to know more people who know more people in Israel. So geographically speaking, whenever you're in Jordan, are you working like kind of like on like the east side of the Dead Sea, like that kind of area? Yes. Yeah, so I work, I've work. worked on several sites in Jordan. Um, the one that I am most frequently frequent, I guess you'd say, is in the southern part of the country, about 70 miles north, or not miles, kilometers, north of the city of Aqaba. Um, and it is right there in the Arava Valley um, along the modern Israeli-Jordanian border. So you can, you can see the Israeli border. You can see the mountains in Israel on the other side of the valley. Oh. It's, a big, it's a big, deep valley of nice and flat and then mountains on both sides. So we're right in the shadow of the mountains on the Jordanian side. But you just look across this flat plain and there's Israel on the highway. People go into the beach in, in Elat. The city Elat is the sort of sister city, I suppose you could say, to Aqaba. They're on either side of the border, but right there on the Red Sea. So it's a big vacation destination for Love people it. in both both countries. That's so cool. Um, so, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Then I was going to say, and I've, I've worked at Petra, too, as part of Petra North Ridge. And so everybody's sort of familiar with where Petra is. Um, but then I've also been involved in a site called Umeri in the Madaba Plains, which is just south of Amman. So if you if you land in the Amman airport and you take the highway up to the city, you pass the site by on the left-hand side of the highway. Very cool. So whenever you're out on like archaeological work in Jordan or in the Middle East or anywhere, what are you most excited by in the work? Like when you're doing it, like what's your favorite part of doing the actual work? Um, the favorite thing is that you just you never know what a day is going to hold. I mean, you can do all of your your research and have a good idea of what you might find and have goals and everything like that. But you just never know what's going to be like the, the next scrape of your trowel is going to honor something that you just never dreamed was was there and so it's just the there's a lot of mundaneness and you know don't get me wrong you have to have a really high tolerance for for sort of boring um if you're going to be an archaeologist because you go long hours sort of without you know like you move a lot of dirt it's a lot about dirt moving but then you just you never know if this is going to be the the scrape or the trowel or the the hoe pass that reveals sort of something amazing do you have a favorite moment on a, on a dig like in your career oh so many maybe so. maybe a couple i'd love to hear about <laughs> like one or two um so in 2013 we were um working i was managing an area that was sort of right outside so this is a site called eingarendal um and it's a fourth century roman fort um, and Romans were, were helpfully consistent in the way that they built things. So we have this nice square 40 meter by 40 meter fort. Um, and we had found after several seasons of looking for it, which side the main gate was on. Um, and true to form, they should have over the main gate had a very large monumental dedicatory inscription that would give you all sorts of information about the emperor who was reigning at the time, the unit that was stationed there, what they called the, the fort and all of that information. Um, and so it should be, it should have been right above the big main doorway. Um, and it's a big old stone. So if it had been there, it should have, when the fort collapsed, fallen. And it should be sort of right outside the front door, sort of smushed on its face mm -hmm. there where it fell. And so we put a, a square out there because we really wanted to find this dedicatory inscription. But of course, there are also all sorts of reasons why, given the sort of vagaries of history, right? Maybe somebody, maybe it didn't get buried as deeply as it could have been, and somebody found it and thought, well, this is cool, and toted it away. Or sometimes they put the big stone in there, but they don't get around to actually inscribing it. Sometimes they're lazy and just painted on, and believe me, that would have gotten sand, like the paint would have gotten sandblasted off in mm -hmm. half a heartbeat. Um, and so we could find the sort of the big, the big stone, and it would have been... Um, completely blank. Um, so we're digging in this area and we're going, we're finding all of the, the sort of the, the arch stones. So there's a big arch over the, the gate and this is right where it should have been. Um, and we finally come down on just this mo the 800 pound massive stone that was just all the right shape and everything. But of course it's face down. Um, and so we have to spend about a week and a half dealing with all the rest of the stuff. You know, we have to dig all around it. We have to photograph. We have to measure. Our architect needs to do her drawings of all these other things. And then we have to get about a dozen 
300 to 400 pound stones out of a hole that's a meter deep in the sand before we can actually flip this sucker over um, and see if it's what we've been hoping for. And so sort of the moment when it goes over and helpfully one of our workmen does what he shouldn't have done, which was sort of dust off the face with his sleeve. We're all like, no, la, 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 la. Um, but it was enough to see that it was in fact inscribed. I mean, the, the inscription was there in the way that we wanted to. And so it was this, I mean, just amazing thing. It's in the um, Archaeological Museum in Amman now, so you can actually go and see our inscription. Oh, um, fantastic. I know. It's really exciting. I tell my students, you know, they they found something. I mean, they can take their children and their children's children and point to this thing in a museum and say, we found that, which is just awesome. That is beautiful. So I would imagine that, you know, as a professor working in archaeology, um, you mentor and work with young folks in the field who are one day hoping to do your job, like do the same job as you. Like what advice would you give to some young budding archaeologist seeking to work with antiquity? Um, go and do it. There are a lot of people who love antiquity and love the sort of results of archaeology, but the day-to-day -day is a little different. Um, and some people, it takes going out in the field to realize, actually, I hate working in the sun and the heat and the bugs. And this is really boring for most of the time. So you, you need to sort of figure out if you are actually the, have the, the personality to, um, to do it. And no shame if you don't. There are plenty of people who would much rather read about archaeology from the comfort of a library and sort of think about things from there. Um, so the best way to know if it's for you is to do it. Um, the first dig I was ever on... Um, was in Israel, and it was a great site, but I was actually ended up in an area um, that we, they realized sort of three quarters of the way through the dig was um, mostly backfill, like like medieval backfill. Mm -hmm. So there was no stratigraphy. There weren't any finds. This was just somebody had put a bunch of dirt back into a house. And, and so there was, there was nothing. We found nothing that was particularly interesting, and I loved every single second of it. So and there was no, sort of, yeah, there was no gratification in terms of sort of finding pretty things or having folks like come and make a big deal over you or anything like that. Um, so if you can dig sort of the most boring and uneventful um, site ever, not site, I shouldn't, I don't want to malign the site, um, part of the site ever, um, when like the people next door to you are literally digging a mosaic church floor, yeah, um, which was awesome. And still you think you had a wonderful time? Um, I feel like that's good, a good way to judge. Go and look for that one transformative experience to see if it if it clicks even when it's boring. I love right. that. So yeah, get your hands dirty is the best way. So what are some of the biggest challenges to working in the region? Um, logistics are hard. Um, you know, it is a very tough environment. They used to have a, when I was um, in that fort on the Israel side, they had a visiting speaker come and talk about how the Arava Valley is an extreme desert. We always sort of thought that was funny. Um, but it is a very trying environment. You know, temperatures are routinely over 100 degrees. Um, it is a, I mean, it, it's dry. And so people say it's a dry heat. So that's true. And it's not as bad as it would be if it was super humid. But it also, your body um, can react in very unexpected ways. I mean, our students can get heat stroke really quickly. And so we just are on them all the time to drink tons of water, um, always having hats on all of that. And so just the logistics of introducing um, people who are not used to that environment to it and then expecting them to do physical labor for many hours during the day, um, that can be a challenge. Um, getting people to see the Middle East as a place that is warm and hospitable and safe and somewhere that they want to go is increasingly difficult um, in, in our sort of current climate in America. Um, the people in Jordan are very much aware of how they're depicted in our media and are very excited to have the opportunity to welcome people um, from America and show them um, what a wonderful country, what a hospitable country Jordan is. Um, but it can be a hard sell for students. It can be a very hard sell to parents to say that we're going to this part of the world that has a undeserved reputation um, for violence. Um, Whenever you go, how long do you usually stay for? Um, our, we usually dig for six weeks and have one week of um, sort of touring around the country, seeing other archaeological sites, other things like that. So it's usually seven weeks for the students in total, and then the staff are there for at least another week sort of between the, the setup and the close down. So it's usually about an eight-week stretch. Excellent. So I kind of want to switch gears a little bit because um, in my classroom, I teach a lot of um, 
biblical scripture studies and a lot of Torah and a lot of uh, the canonized gospels. And I know that you do in your teaching as well. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about your side of work in the academy at Mizzou. So what are some of your favorite experiences of being a professor working within the world of like religion and scripture and working with young people in your job? So one of my favorite classes to teach is the introduction to the Hebrew Bible, um, because I think that a lot of students are not familiar with its contents, even though it's sort of a, a book that many of them feel some degree of, of ownership of. Um, but they sort of tended to gloss over, except for sort of the famous passages that you get in a Sunday school setting or something like that. You don't get a lot of the details. And so I really enjoy having them read sort of the lesser appreciated bits um, of the Hebrew Bible and to see the real complexity. One of the things I love about the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, is its multivocality. It does not try to go back and establish uniformity on any number of a variety of subjects. It allows voices of dissent. It allows voices of contradiction. Um, and it doesn't try and, and pretend a uniformity that didn't exist in the Iron Age. Amos is springing to mind right now. Hmm. Um, what are some of your favorite um, passages or books or prophets to have the students read within something like the Tanakh? Oh, I feel like they get irritated with me because every day I walk in and say, okay, this is one of my favorite sections. Um, I like to the, have them read sort of the, the sketchy bits of Judges, um, of which there are a lot. I think that the that's that book is one that gets cherry picked a lot so we sort of read happy stories like deborah or the sort of the swashbuckly ones like samson um but don't read some of the grittier um and more difficult passages um like the the levites concubine and things like that that i think are important to recognize that there is um extreme violence particularly extreme violence against women that is part of this book's contents and therefore part of the the Hebrew Bible's heritage, and it needs to be dealt with. It shouldn't be sort of skimmed over. Do you um, teach any classes like in like the canonized Gospels as well? Sure. Okay, so what are what are some of your favorite uh, Gospels things to teach about? Um, we sort of read, a, I, I like to talk about secretive angry Jesus in Mark. Um, again, students are, are very used to a sort of a a composite picture of Jesus that is that is created from reading all four Gospels. Um, sort of smushed together. Um, and when you try to very rigorously read each gospel on its own, keeping in mind that many very early Christian communities would not have had access to all four canonical gospels. Um, these were not bound together and circulated as a unit for a very long time, um, at least into the third century. And so you could have a community that had only, only Luke. And what would you know, quote, you know, to quote unquote, know about Jesus if you only had access to one gospel. And it really, I think that students are able to, the sort of a light goes on and realize, oh, each author had particular ideas about what, what the good news was, what, what news they were trying to spread. Um, and it also helps them realize that these are works by an author who they're all right. All these guys, these four guys are telling the same story, but they're telling it in very particular ways for specific reasons and sort of thinking about the reasons why each story or why each author is telling the story in the way that he is um, helps them appreciate those those differences that, that end up being pretty significant. Hmm. So I read some of your scholarship recently about a lot of the topics that you're just mentioning, and it's an article about the life of the historical Jesus of Nazareth. And Honestly, the types of writings that you did in this article are some of the things about Jesus that I am most personally interested in. I'm interested in like the man and the context in which he lived, which I think is something that is overlooked in favor of more of like the savior discussion and like the Messiah discussion. But I'm interested in the guy and the context. So what are some of the major must know details of first century Judaism in the time of Jesus, because I think that like knowing the context is really demonstrative and important of things that we often miss. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about, yeah, so I'll try and pick. Um, I think that 
many readers of the Gospels don't really realize the degree to which Jesus was having sort of Jewish conversations about Jewish things. You know, I think that it's, it's easy to acknowledge, you know, yes, we understand that Jesus was Jewish, but the things that were important in his preaching, the things that he argued with people about, the ways that he was in encouraging people to behave, these were all stemming out of not a, a rejection of things Jewish, but a, a differing interpretation. So there were lots of different sort of Jewish interpretive schools, let's say, even though it wasn't as formal as that. Um, different different groups of Jews who interpreted the law, who thought had different thoughts about the best way to be Jewish. And so Jesus was one of those. And so he was trying to encourage and instruct his followers, again, from our gospel sources at least, um, in, a, in a specific way to understand how they should practice Judaism um, in their time. And that those conversations make a lot more sense if you realize sort of what what they're really about. So I'm curious if you can say like uh, Robbie or Gregory and I, whenever we talked, um, mentioned a little bit of the things that would be recognizable and unrecognizable versus like today and medieval Christianity. So if we looked at Christianity and Judaism today, what are some of the things that would be recognizable versus unrecognizable in the time of Jesus? Whenever, whenever he had his practice as a Jewish rabbi, like, would we? Would, is anything the same? Is anything similar? Well, in Jesus' time, of course, Judaism was still a primarily sacrificial religion, right? The temple was still operating, and the main focus of Jewish ritual practice involved animal sacrifice and other kinds of sacrifice too at the temple in Jerusalem. And so, it, it was very much a Jerusalem-oriented kind of of religion. Um, Christianity, of course, um, wasn't around in Jesus' time. You know, Jesus didn't sort of see himself as beginning Christianity. Um, he was doing Judaism, just his own take on that. And so there's there's very little um, in terms of modern Christian practice, I think, that you could say would be recognized, you know, as you sort of show Jesus something that was was happening in a Christian context. I think that, that mostly that would not be something that could relate. Right. So let's talk about the Roman context a little mm. bit. So to me, the Roman context of first century Palestine is pertinent, and I think that it's overlooked a lot. So what do modern people, Christians and non-Christians alike, most egregiously overlook when talking about the life of Jesus of Nazareth? Oh, here, I thought you were going to go a slightly different direction with the very end of that question. Um <laughs> Or you could talk about the context and like, what do we overlook in the time period? So either way, like whatever angle you want to take on that question is completely fine with me. Um, I think that people don't realize that that Romans did not persecute Christians because of their religion. I think that that's a very broad misconception. Does that sort of Absolutely. hit what you're looking at? Yeah. So, so there's a sort of a, a wide idea that Christians were persecuted by the Romans for being Christians. And that is both true and not true. Um the Roman Empire was a place of great religious tolerance. And I always get funny looks from students when I try and tell them that because they have this idea. And I'm not trying to say that Romans didn't persecute Christians. They did, although much less and more sporadically than, than most people realize. But it wasn't because of religion, at least from the Romans' point of view. Um, the issue was that both and this is where it gets really interesting, both Jews and Christians denied the reality of the Roman gods um, and refused to perform the kind of sacrifices that demonstrated that you were a loyal Roman citizen, that you needed to um, mostly um, offer a sacrifice to the the emperor and the sort of the, the personified empire. So to Rome and Augustus, you needed to do these sacrifices. And both Jews and Christians refused. The Jews, however, were able to reach an accommodation. Um, they refused, they said, you know, according to our ancestral customs, which the Romans respected because they were really old and, and the Romans liked old things, we are have to be exclusively loyal to our one God. Um, we can't offer sacrifices to Roman Augustus, but we will offer sacrifices at our temple to our God on behalf of Rome and Augustus. And the Romans were like, all right, all right, that makes sense to us. We're good. Christians didn't have any kind of accommodation like that that they could make. And so when they refused and said, we don't believe in the Roman gods and we're not going to offer sacrifices to them, 
And Roman's sort of like, all right, so so what are you going to do? And there was no good answer, right? Christians didn't have anything like the Jewish temple to to substitute. They, they couldn't find a workaround. Of this. And so they were labeled seditious. They were labeled as traitors, as, as threats to the empire. And so what are you going to do? They, so from the Roman perspective, rooting out Christians meant rooting out potential traitors, people who were a uh, social risk. So from the Christian perspective, of course, it was religious persecution because their rejection, their refusal to comply with what Rome wanted them to do was based on religious grounds, but the Romans didn't see it like that. Um, so we had, it's a, a fascinating um, instance of two sides completely misunderstanding what the other was actually looking for, and they couldn't find an accommodation. And so Christians were sort of in this awkward spot there. And again, there wasn't sort of a systematic empire-wide sort of dedicated persecutory system, you know, the way that, um, well, there wasn't one of that, you know, it was sort of when, when thing, when ill feeling arose, it was usually on a local level because of specific incidents. And there were only a couple of different occasions on which there was any kind of sort of general, general persecution that was enacted. So this is an opinion question. Do you think Jesus and like the first century era in which he lived, like, do you think that we do it a disservice today by not studying this context in greater depth? I think that it depends on the the purposes that you want to know things about. Um, I think that, I mean, I, I always think that everybody benefits from having a better understanding of context, I suppose, is what I would first say. So I don't think there is ever anything bad about knowing more about the times and places in which the things that are important to you came into existence and were first used and first read. Um, But people read a text like the New Testament with very different intents. Um, And I think that for many people, probably they, they get plenty out of it, not understanding what it was originally intended to mean. In this article that I've uh, that I read of yours the other day, um, you did some fantastic comparative writing in the piece where you kind of like looked at some of the different pieces of the of the canonical gospels and Matthew and Luke, and you kind of looked at like how they were similar and different a little bit. What are some of your favorite similarities or differences like across those four canonical gospels? Um. I enjoy the fact that both Matthew and Luke write sort of elaborate, illustrious birth narratives for Jesus that accomplish the same goal, which is to explain that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but raised in Nazareth. But they tell entirely different stories to get there. Um, And that most people have gotten used to sort of the traditional nativity play version of events in which there are shepherds and wise men and sheep and, you know, sort of all of the things. But if you, again, read um, Matthew and then Luke separately, you realize that that is a mashup of the two stories that doesn't actually exist anywhere in the canonical gospels. You've sort of, you've, you've created another gospel um, and that the, they're actually entirely discrete, standalone, separate stories that tell different things. Um, which is really interesting because, again, both authors had very clear goals. Like they needed to convey certain information to their readers, but they go about constructing their stories in different ways. That is quite amazing. And when I was looking at this piece as well, I noticed that there are there are great pains taken to say that Jesus is born in Bethlehem of Judea. Mm-hmm. Why is this so important that Jesus be born in Judea in the Bible? So there are, for, for a number of reasons, um, Judea is the sort of, it's, it's the territory where Jerusalem is. Um, it is the tribal sort of home of the ancestry that, the biblical authors want to tie Jesus to that of King David, um, right? So that David ruled in Jerusalem and was part of that particular tribal family. Um, And so they want to connect Jesus' lineage to that because of the um, various prophetic references in the Hebrew Bible that they can then use to connect Jesus to to Hebrew Bible predictions of a uh, expected savior coming there. 
um, on a more sort of interestingly historical level. And the, the issue that I think that many, again, readers are not as familiar with is that not the, the Galilee, among other regions, was not until only a couple of generations before Jesus' birth, was not actually an area that was populated by Jews. And so if you notice the gospel writers are make a big deal at different times about Jesus and his disciples being from Galilee. Um, and the, one of the passion narratives, one of the, the slave girls out in the courtyard throws a little shade saying, you know, you guys are Galileans. I can tell from your voice. That is not a compliment. That was a, that was an insult. Um, it was not a good thing to be known as someone from Galilee, right? You get these sort of different little snide references. What good is ever, you know, what, when does that something good ever come out of Nazareth, right? This is, this is because Jerusalem and Judea were the sort of the homeland. This is where people who were Jewish in the sense that they had been exiled to Babylon and come back under Ezra and Nehemiah, who started to get really squiffy about who intermarried with whom. So um, they wanted you to be able to, on both sides of your family, trace your bloodline back through to uh, the exilic community in Babylon. Um, And so for a while, for a couple of centuries after that period, Jews were only the people living in Judea. Um, There were a lot of, a lot of stuff happened. Um, And you end up with a situation where the people who were ruling in Judea, a family called the Hasmoneans, a Jewish family, um, conquered some of the neighboring territories, both north and south of them, including the Galilee. And in a very unusual and and sort of unmatched moment, um, they forcibly converted the people who were living there to Judaism. They required that they live according to Jewish law, which is what you had to do to be Jewish. Um, And so that's that's the region where Jesus grew up. And so only two generations later, um, these people are, the sort of the, the inhabitants of Galilee are Jews now, but they're Galilean Jews. And you can find places in the New Testament, in the Gospels, where that distinction is maintained, right? Someone, okay, is a Jew, but they're a Galilean Jew. And, and there was meaning and, and again, shade um, that was intended by that description, right? You're Jewish, but you're a Galilean Jew, which is to say sort of a a sort of Jew, a fake Jew. So if Jesus had been born 100 years earlier, he would not have been Jewish. If he was born in Galilee of Galilean family, yes. So again, that is why it's so important to say, okay, they were in Galilee, but they were really from Judea, hence Bethlehem in Judea. Judea, right? We're going to go back and trace that ancestry to make sure that Jesus's credentials as a real Jew are, like, can't be doubted. I am going to point listeners to this article so that they can look more into this themselves, because that's important stuff. And growing up in, like, Catholic school and things like that, I was never... And aware of anything called the Hasmoneans or forced conversion or Galilean Jew versus Judean Jew. Like these were conversations that I was never privy to as a young person growing up um, in church. Yeah, I wasn't either. There's all sorts of, I mean, there's crazy stuff there in history. That is amazing. So there's one last thing I want to ask about in this article. So If I'm looking at Galilee, so if I'm looking at this map of Palestine in the time of Jesus in 4 BC to AD 30, in the north of what is now Israel is called Galilee. In the central region is called Samaria, and in the south is called Judea. Most of this is now within the modern day West Bank of Judea and Samaria. Mm -hmm. So if we look in Galilee in North um, Palestine, we see a tiny little town next to Galilee. Nazareth in Galilee, Jesus' hometown, that's also called Bethlehem. This was an interesting thing to me. Has any research ever been done into the Galilean Bethlehem, which is like, like it looks like only a couple miles away from Nazareth? Not that I'm aware of, but there have been, um, I'm I'm blanking on the name, of course, right in this moment, Um, a couple of people who have been very interested in sort of... uh, exploring the Galilee of Jesus. So that's been a big topic um, of late. And I can't believe I can't remember this person's name. Um, but if there's, a, if there's a thing there, that would be the person who is looking at it. But that, again, I think is why the Gospels are very particular to say Bethlehem in Judea. Because Excellent. Galilee and Judea were essentially different countries mm-hmm. at this point. And so um, 
even with all the things that they shared, they were different territories. And again, you see that when it comes out, when the squabble about is, is Pilate going to be in charge of Jesus or is Herod Antipas at his trial, right? That squabble is originating in the fact that he was, his crime was committed in Judea, but he was a Galilean. And so who has jurisdiction over this particular problem? If you remember who that is later on, you can shoot me an email and I will put it in the introduction of this episode. I will do so that. So that whenever people hear this little section of the conversation, we can be like, <laughs> oh yeah, they already know who we're talking about. So we don't know in the moment, but they will know because I will put it in the introduction that they will be listening to way later. Lucky listeners. It's fantastic. Dr. Carrie Duncan, this has been a wonderful conversation on classical ideas. Thank you so much. I've learned so much about the historical Jesus, Galilee, Nazareth, archaeology, the Gospels, the Torah, so much more. I'm so excited, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Classical Ideas is produced by me, Greg Soden. Music on Classical Ideas is performed and composed by Derek Streibig. You can find his music at www.wearewarmmusic.com. If you would like to support this show, please subscribe or leaving a rating in iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.